Would you like to stand? I'm going to read today from the book of Ephesians chapter 6 and the book of Ecclesiastes chapter 3. Now, to be patently honest with you, somewhere about 20 years ago, I preached a little short sermon on Sunday night. It wasn't a Bible study. I just preached a little message. <clears throat> and for whatever reason, after all these years, never preached it again, probably wasn't worth preaching the first time and certainly not visiting again. But after all of these years, I feel to talk about that subject. So I'm going to talk about it from Ephesians chapter 6 and Ecclesiastes chapter number 3. Now, I might and I might not um, talk about particularly what I believe or don't believe, which is not overly important. What this Bible says is what's important. But let me just say, I feel like that there are a lot of preachers and saints and preachers' wives in this building that hopefully this message or the word of the Lord can help you in some fashion. It's not necessarily on doctrine. It's not necessarily on standards. But I want to tell you something. I am a dyed in the wool, one God, apostolic, Jesus' name, holiness preacher. Amen. Amen. Now, if that doesn't satisfy your craving to know where I'm at, you just hang around or just come to Gina or just send for a few tapes. And uh, what I am here, I am there. But I just want to say to you as a person and especially as a preacher, and I don't know how to explain this, but our doctrine and especially our standards somehow come in a package and when you get rid of one of them, all of them are going. Amen. Now, I just want to say that to you. And you take it for what it's worth. I have been all over America. I am 65 years old. I have had the Holy Ghost going on 52 years. I do not know of a church that is frozen in a state of backsliding and went just so far and stopped. You don't ever stop when you go down that road. And I don't know what it is, but a little cut hair calls for a little makeup. A little makeup calls for a little jewelry. A little jewelry calls for short sleeves and short skirts and plunging necklines and a beard on daddy and a gold chain around his neck and a few other things. And all of that calls for a little more and that calls for a little more and that calls for a little more. And pretty soon you are not even recognizable as anything remotely close to what you used to be. I'm telling you, don't ever let down. Don't ever start. Beware of the fork in the road. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Now, having said that, let me read to you from Ephesians chapter 6, beginning at verse 10. Ephesians 6, 10. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestled not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day. And having done all to stand, he just simply says in verse 14, stand therefore. And he goes on and tells us about the armor of God. He talks about being able to withstand in the evil day. I want you to hold on to that. The evil day. In Ecclesiastes chapter number 3, <coughs> Solomon says in verse 10, I have seen the travail which God hath given to the sons of men to be exercised in it. He hath made everything beautiful in his time. Also, he hath set the world, or eternity, 
or the age in their heart so that no man can find out the work that God maketh from the beginning to the end. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. And you may be seated. <coughs> I want to call your attention to the statement that Solomon made that he has made everything beautiful in his time. Pardon me for taking my jacket off. I'm used to preaching without a coat and I'm making myself at home. So that's the problem. <coughs> He's made everything beautiful in his time. And Paul said that we need the armor of God that we can withstand in the evil day. Now I want to talk about a couple of things here to establish this lesson, this message. And then I want you to hold on to them. And then I'll try to bring it all together, hopefully, and make a little sense out of it. <clears throat> I want to talk to you for a few minutes today about recycled evil. <clears throat> recycled evil. It's quite a, sounds almost like an oxymoron. A little bit ridiculous sounding. <clears throat> but this is a big world in recycling. Not so much in Gina. They just throw it out on the side of the road. But, uh, <laughs> and I'm serious. If you don't believe it, you come to LaSalle Parish and you'll find out. It's a garbage dump of the world. <clears throat> but uh, recycling is a pretty big thing in our world. And I was a little shocked to find out that 94% of all automobiles will wind up in a scrapyard. <clears throat> and then they will turn around. <clears throat> and at this juncture, probably it's even a little higher, they say that 75% of every vehicle can be used again and it can be taken maybe not brought back in its original form but in some form it can be used and it can be beneficial again they say that in the future that they will take the remaining 25 percent of this vehicle which includes the foam and the seats and the seals and uh certain components of that automobile that are a little hard to recycle and they can recycle it and make something from it taking trash and turning it into treasures uh it's amazing to me <clears throat> that they can take windshields and milk bottles and clorox bottles and coke bottles and whiskey bottles and all kinds of bottles and window panes and turn them into some kind of a beautiful vase or some kind of a beautiful piece of stained glass such as is in this building they can take old Coke cans and aerosol cans and beer cans and oil cans and juice cans and every kind of can of aluminum and steel, and they can process it. One of the industries, if you call it an industry that we have in Gina, is a little recycling place. We don't have any industries in Gina of any sort. I tell people the closest thing we ever had to heavy industry in Gina was a 300-pound Avon woman. And... Uh, that's the closest we've ever been to heavy industry. <clears throat> and, I, and I'm serious. We do not have one manufacturing plant in China. But we have a little uh, aluminum uh, recycling deal or collection area, I should say. And, man, they gather up some junk and bring it out there to that place. And it's right at the city limits, and that welcomes you to Gina. We've got a big, nice sign up. It says, Gina, nice place to call home. And under it's a pile of garbage. And I'm serious. I'm not just joking. Amen. And, of course, they can take all kinds of plastic plates and dry cleaning bags and garbage bags and plastic knives and forks and spoons and pampers and Walmart bags, and they make all kinds of stuff out of that. They crush it. They mold it, they stamp it, they machine it, they melt it, and they mold it again, they grind it, they sand it, they polish it, and then turn around and sell it to us for a fortune. Recycling, taking junk, taking sorry stuff, taking garbage, taking stinking stuff, stuff you throw away that's no good, that gets in the way, that's in the house, it's irritating. Me and Sister Coon don't have many problems left after 45 years. But garbage can be a problem at our house. Hallelujah. I can just walk right by it and not see a big bag of it. Hallelujah. And I'm sure I'm the only blind man in this building. <coughs> Amen. 
And you know, as I tell people, I don't always, I don't know that I just always go around just feeling, feeling, feeling saved, although I am saved. I don't always go around just feeling, feeling, feeling married, but I am married. And when the garbage gets pretty high, I learn I am married. <laughs> Amen. So uh, garbage is quite a, it's quite a thing. It can be quite a problem in this country. It can be a problem at your house. It's a, it's a societal problem. Now, I could talk about that. I don't want to give you a bunch of stats and data and all of that junk. You're not interested in that. But I want you to hold on to this garbage concept, trash. This church has been hauling off a lot of it in the last several days with all of us eating and all that stuff that's going on. Now, <clears throat> let's switch gears a little bit. Let's go into a polar opposite direction. And let me just simply, and I, I don't want to spend a lot of time on any of this. Let me just simply say to you that when Adam and Eve ate of that tree, it was a tree of knowledge or of knowing what is good and what is evil. Now, let me say to you that whenever they ate of that forbidden fruit, it opened up to them and to us a vestibule and a vestige and an entrance into a tremendous world of knowledge of good and of evil. There's a lot of good things, and that, that word knowing there does not just simply mean that it is an intellectual grasping an understanding and interpretation of that that is good and evil. <clears throat> but you're going to experience it. You're going to know it. It's going to be a part and a parcel and a part of your life. We understand that. And not to spend a lot of time on the issue, but to just get to the heart of what I want to talk about. One of the components of that knowledge was the knowledge of evil. Now understand that the word evil, <clears throat> I understand its connotation. I understand that more often than not, when you say evil, you automatically think of wickedness and sin and bad and cussing and lying and pornography and movies and filth and trash and the debauchery and the sin and the crime. We think of evil in that particular conceptualization. But let me simply say to all of you brothers and sisters that whenever that tree of knowledge of good and evil was opened up unto mankind, and we entered into that vestibule of knowledge that we would know. And God knows that we have enjoyed much of the good things of life. And we have witnessed the sin and the crime and the wickedness that we call evil. But that word evil there also means <clears throat> that, that there is trouble and there is distress and there is hurt and there is sorrow and there is weeping and there is pain. When you get to studying the word evil, it comes from a Hebrew word ra and a Greek word porneros. And when you study those words, you will find that uh, evil is far more than just sin and wickedness. But brother, whenever man fail, he opened unto us that great door of adversity and of sorrow and agony and loss and difficulty and hurt. There is an innumerable string of adjectives to describe what evil is. The sorrows and the pains and the hurts and the disappointments of life are multitudinous. It is impossible for me to describe every situation and every hurt and every sorrow that can come into your life. That is the reason that the God of heaven so designed for this church, for every preacher and every saint, that is in this building. He designed for you that armor of God. And I, I don't want to spend, not that it's not worthy, but I don't want to spend much time on that armor. But I just want to simply tell you that the armor of God is designed for you to appropriate and to use and to clothe yourself in that you can stand against the wiles of the devil. And the Bible said that we are to take unto us the whole armor of God that we may be able to withstand in the evil day. Amen. I taught a Bible study many years ago on the evil day. That word evil day there does not mean a day of sin in your life or a day that you fail God 
are a day of wickedness. The Bible is telling you to take unto yourself the whole armor of God that you can stand in the day of adversity and in the day of trial and in the day of hardship and in the day of sorrow. I'm going to tell you, sir and ma'am, you're going to need the shield of faith somewhere in your life. You're going to need the sword of the Spirit someday in your life. Someday you're going to stand beside a casket. Someday you're going to stand beside a hospital bed. Someday you're going to stand by, beside a child that's in trouble and beside a companion that is in pain. And you're going to need a shield of faith. Praise God. Someday you're going to suffer loss and you're going to need a shield of faith to quench the fiery darts of the devil because the devil will destroy you in the time of adversity. Amen. Amen. And if you think living for God shields you from diversity, I've got some news for you, sir. It does not. And I don't think that's a shock to anybody in this building. <clears throat> Hallelujah. Brother, if you live for God, the devil's going to throw the kitchen sink at you. You understand what I'm saying? Hallelujah. Every devil in hell is after you. And the more you preach and the stronger you preach, the more devils is going to get after you. Amen. You hear me? I'm telling you, sir. The closer you get to God, the more the devil's going to fight you. But I'm here to also tell you that there is an armor of God. There is something to help us to stand. Hallelujah. You don't have to collapse in a time of trouble. You don't have to throw in the towel when things are bad. You don't have to quit serving God when things get hard. My God has got some armor. Hallelujah. My God has got some power. Glory to God. And God will sustain you in the darkest of the hours of your life. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Whenever Job's wife said to him, why don't you curse God and die? He said, woman, you speak like a foolish woman. He said, shall not we receive good at the hand of God? And shall not we receive evil? I'm going to tell you something. God's not going to hand you any sin and wickedness. God cannot be tempted with evil. In the sense of wickedness and sin, neither does he tempt us with wickedness and sin. If you're tempted to do wrong, you are tempted when you're drawn away of your own lust. Now, that's the Bible. Amen. So, <clears throat> what Job is telling his wife is, listen, if we live for God, we're going to have good things. And we're going to have adverse things. And we're going to have bad things. And we're going to have trouble times. And we're going to have hard times. And you're speaking like a foolish woman for me to curse God and to die. Let me challenge everybody in this building. Whenever you are in a mode of hurt and of disappointment and sorrow and loss and pain, that's the time to bless the name of the Lord. Hallelujah. Prior to that, he told his wife on another occasion, he said, the Lord gives and the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Hallelujah. I'm going to tell you, sir, it's easy to bless the Lord when you're getting. It's easy to bless the Lord when he's given to you. It's easy to bless the Lord when it's coming down the pike for you. And the pay is good and the health is good and everything is fine. But what are you going to do when he takes away from you? What are you going to do when you lose it? What are you going to do when everything goes wrong? What are you going to do when that baby dies that you prayed for? I'm going to tell you if we're smart, we'll stand with tears running down our face. And we'll say the Lord give it. And the Lord took it away. But I still He'll bless his name. He's still a good God. He's still a mighty God. He's still the Lord of the universe. I'm not mad at God. I'm not disturbed at God. I'm telling you, he's a good God today. I bless his name. I glorify his name. I treasure the name of the Lord today. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. <clears throat> Some of you know Elder Brother Walter Rains. Brother Rains told me this story. One on one, not preaching, but he just told it to me. <clears throat> he and I were contemporary pastors in Indiana 30 something years ago. And, uh, he married to make the story as brief as possible. He married a young couple in Fort Wayne. They took a honeymoon. They come back after three or four days and they went on a fishing trip and they were out in the lake at Fort Wayne. The boat capsized and they both drowned. Said a beautiful couple. No disrespect. 
he said this to me. No disrespect, Brother Coon. He said, but the girl's dad was a Swedish man. And said he was very stoical. He was very staid. He was not emotional. He said, I've known him a long time. He was very, very sober. Very, very Swedish, I guess you'd say. And so <laughs> he said, I sent somebody to tell the boy's parents that he had drowned. And he said, it was my job to go tell the girl's parents that she had drowned. <clears throat> he said, I'll never forget. Knocked on that door. And he said, by the time they answered the door, he said, tears was dripping off my chin. <clears throat> he said, I was just heartbroke. And he said, her daddy answered the door. He said, he opened the door in a historical and stayed way. He's standing there and he called him by name. And he said, I've got some bad news for you. I'm sorry, but your daughter has just been drowned in a boating accident. And he said, I'm standing there and tears just running off my face. And he said, that man looked at me just as stoical and just as stayed. And said, all of a sudden, big old tears and just kind of started running down his face. And he said, I didn't know what to say. And he said, I'll never forget that big old Swedish brother. He said, he said his lips was trembling and he was weeping. And he said, Brother Rains, he said, the Lord gives. And he said he could tell he was struggling. And he said, the Lord takes away. And he said he didn't say nothing. He just stood there, tears running off of his chin. He said, I reached up and put my hand on his shoulder. And he said, Daddy, can you say it all? And he said, give me just a minute, Brother Rains. And he said, I'll never forget through trembling, shaking of his body and his lips. He said, blessed be the name of the Lord. Hallelujah. I wonder, can you bless his name today? Wherever you're at, whatever's going on in your life, whatever happens to you from this day forward, are you going to have the godliness and the courage and the tenacity and the spirit and the forward vision enough to say, God, I bless your name. I love you in spite of what's happening in life. You're still a mighty, mighty God. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. I'm telling you folks, we're serving a mighty God today. Hallelujah, hallelujah. <clears throat> Let me say to everybody in this building, whoever you are, even if you're not saved, but especially if you're saved and if you're a preacher today, you're highly exposed to the evils of this life. And remember the definition. You are exposed to it. The fall opened it up unto us. And I'm going to tell you, it's like a giant landfill and garbage dump that it seems like that we are inundated under. It's like, it seems like that the devil, every time you look around, he's dumping something in your life. The problems and the hurts and the sorrows and the agonies of your life. But I want to tell you that Jehovah God of heaven has set up a mighty recycling program. And when he gets through with all of that mess that the devil is trying to destroy you with, I'm going to tell you God is going to bring something good out of all of the things that we think are so bad in this life. Hallelujah. You just wait, sir. It ain't all over with yet. Praise God. The fat lady hadn't sung yet, mister. We are in for a glorious day. Out thunder in the future after a while. Hallelujah be to God. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. <coughs> Praise God. 
I'm going to tell you, sir, my Bible said he makes everything beautiful in his time. He didn't say in your time. He said in his time. You just give God a little while, sir, and he knows what to do with the devil's junk. He knows what to do with life's troubles. Huh? He knows what to do with everything that you're facing in your life today. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Aren't you glad we're serving a God like that? Amen, amen, amen. <coughs> Hallelujah. I don't want to give you all my sermons. Then give you one or two. <coughs> but I taught a Bible study many years ago on all things work together for good to them that love God. Now I told you already I don't know nothing about cooking and washing and ironing. I hope I die before my wife does. And I'm serious. I'm just as serious as I've ever been. And I told my church that. And I said, in case I, that don't happen, if she goes first, I said, now bless your heart. I want all y'all to get busy in a hurry and organize a widower's ministry. <laughs> And I want you to go to cooking for me and keeping my house clean and my clothes clean. I don't know how to do nothing. Now, I don't expect that to happen, but I'm hoping I leave here before she does. But regardless, I, I had my wife get together everything that goes in a cake. And I brought it and I put it out in front of the church. And I don't even know what goes in a cake. But I had shortening had a can of Crisco, I had a can of sugar, I had some salt, I had some baking powder, I had some flour. What else, baby? I don't know. That'll make something. Eggs. Had a dozen eggs, I think, or something. I don't know if it takes a dozen or not, but whatever it takes. I guess it is if you're making an egg cake, you need at least a dozen. <laughs> Hallelujah. So I had all this stuff sitting out here on the communion table. I'm teaching. I say, now, how many of you would like to come up here and eat a tablespoon full of lard, we call it in Louisiana, Crisco, shorten it. How many of you would like a half a stick of butter right now? You know, even a tablespoon full of sugar don't sound real good. Now, just a little lick or two is pretty sweet, but not, you're going to get in too much of it and you just, you gag on the mess. Am I right or wrong? Amen. And I had all this stuff up here. And I said, now it's amazing. I've got everything here to make a cake. And don't anybody want any of it. Nobody wants a part of it. Because you know where I'm going. But you take it and you sift it, the flour. And you mix it and you beat it and you mix it and you beat it and you push it and you pull it. And then you put it in a pan and you heat it intensely. And you go through all the process. And when you get through, everybody wants some of the cake. But nobody wants any of the ingredients. God didn't say that each thing in your life works together for good. Sometimes all you're getting is the shortening. Next, next week, you get a mouthful of raw eggs. Next week, you get a big mouthful of butter. Next week, you gagged on sugar. And you say, oh, God, I can't handle any more of this junk. But he's taking all of that stuff, and he's making something out of you. All things work together. He ain't through with his recycling program yet. He's not through doing what he can do in your life. Hallelujah. I'm going to tell you, sir, we're not dealing with, with, with this earth's garbage man tonight. We're dealing with the God of heaven. Hallelujah. And he knows how to take the adversities of life. He knows how to take the hurt and the sorrow and the pain and the disappointment. He knows how to take the things that knock us down. And he can lift us up after a while. Hallelujah. Hey, brother, I've got faith in the God of heaven. I've got faith in this apostolic experience. Our God is going to see this church through after a while. Wow. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Praise God, praise God, praise God. 
<clears throat> amen, amen. I don't have time to preach all I thought I might preach about today. But most of us <clears throat> in this building have preached a little bit perhaps about Samson and a lot of things about Samson. But probably have preached about Samson's riddle. <clears throat> Samson went down to the land of the Philistines, not to make the story long. Father and mother's going down with him. Lion come out and roared against him, and he killed him. A few days later, he was passing by. And, <clears throat> pardon me. And that old stinking, dead lion had a beehive up inside of it in his carcass. Maybe the uh, animals had eaten away the flesh. Maybe nothing was left but the rib cage and the carcass, just the bone structure. I don't know how much was left or how much was gone. But there was a there was some honey in that hive inside of that lion that just a few days earlier had roared against Samson. So Samson reached in the carcass. He got him some honey, <laughs> eat it, took it, give his mom and daddy some. And he said, man, good honey, in essence. And uh, so he went on down to the land of the Philistines, and he was kind of working a little deal there so he could knock a few of them in the head or whatever he did to them at that time. And uh, whatever, he, and he's, he's pretty vicious with them. And uh, he went down and he said, now I'll tell you what, <clears throat> I got a little riddle here. And I'm going to tell you guys, and if you know the answer to it, uh, he said, uh, I'll give you 30 changes of raiment. If you don't know the answer to it, you give me 30 changes of raiment. I said, all right, good deal. So he, they said, what's a riddle? And, uh, you know, did you ever play riddle, riddle Marie? I see something that you don't see. Ain't none of you old enough to know what I'm talking about. Hallelujah. If you can't punch it with your thumb or finger, you don't know how to do it. Hallelujah. Well, let me go on. But we used to play that game. Riddle, riddle, Marie, I see something that you don't see. Riddles, 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 riddles. And he said, my riddle that I've got to you, give to you is this. <clears throat> that out of the eater came forth meat. And out of the strong came forth sweetness. You know what it is? Out of the strong or out of the eater come meat and out of the strong come sweetness? No. Can't figure that one out. They bumped heads. They talked. They discussed. They couldn't figure it out. And he made the sad mistake that a lot of people make. He told a woman. <laughs> what his riddle was and you know the story he said that you plowed with my heifer <laughs> or you would not that's quite a thing to call a lady isn't it you plowed with my heifer you know the bible's pretty and i don't want to be i want to be a gentleman the bible's kind of tough on women sometimes it just simply says if you find a wife you find a good thing just a thing it's a good thing but it's a thing Hallelujah. Now, the Lord said that. You just take that up with somebody else, okay? So then he told them, and they, they found out what it was. And uh, he said, but if you had to plow with my heifer, you wouldn't have known that. But when he went to ask them, said, now, <clears throat> do you know the answer? Yeah, we got the answer, and I told you how they got the answer. And you know the answer because you've read it in the Bible. They simply said... What is sweeter than honey? And what is stronger than a lion? That's the answer to the riddle. Out of the eater comes meat. Out of the strong comes sweetness. And what is stronger than a lion? And what is sweeter than a honey? Let me simply say to you, ladies and gentlemen, that there is a lion that would roar against you. And there are things that would destroy you and that would destroy me. But in the power of the Spirit, 
The thing, and you listen to this old gray-headed preacher today. The thing that would destroy you can become meat in your life. The thing that you think is the most bitter in life can become the sweetest experience in your life. Hallelujah. Out of the eater comes meat and out of the strong comes sweetness. Hallelujah. I'm going to tell you, God's got a way of turning the tide on the devil. God's got a way of turning the tide on the things of this life. Glory to God. Do you hear me, sir? It's not all over with yet. We are not to the end of the journey. I want to ask you something today. Is the devil roaring against you? Don't feel bad, sir. The devil is fighting all of us. Hallelujah. You know, I meet a lot of people and everybody I meet is doing absolutely fantastic. Hallelujah. Is that the truth or is that not the truth? You know, everybody I meet is doing fantastic. I shake hands with people in my church. I say, how you doing? Oh, if I was doing any better, I couldn't stand it. And I meet somebody else. Hallelujah. And I go shake their hand and say, how you doing, brother? And he rolls his eyes like a dying calf. And you would think he had a million dollars and he owes everybody in the country. And he says, oh, I'm doing absolutely fabulous. Is it not a great day, Reverend? Hallelujah. And I'm thinking, Lord, what's wrong with me? <laughs> you know, I've asked that question several times. You know, I go to meetings like this, and most of the time somebody rode in on a plane and prayed two or three millionaires through to the Holy Ghost and a movie star or two. I got to set by the president. It's all kind of stuff. Now, I just, you know, I'll come in on a plane sitting by an old charismatic woman that's going to name angels at an angelic convention somewhere. And I got to listen to her tongue rattle and her earrings jingle and... All of that kind of mess. Oh, my God. I'm cursed on airplanes with that kind of trash. <laughs> Hallelujah. I'm just serious as I can be. Hey, man. I'm telling you the truth. I got on an airplane one morning. Little old airport. Monroe, Louisiana pilot come on and said, it's time for us to take off, but we've got a lady coming. She's late for the plane, and we're going to wait on her. She'll be here in a few minutes. Well, they ain't ever waited on me for nothing, but anyway, I didn't care. There's about five people on the airplane. And so we sat there, I believe it's 45 minutes we sat there waiting on sister, whoever she was, to get there. And of course, you know how they'd come in, just buggies and bustles and, and bags and just, just, here they come. And so she comes down out and there's seats, 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 and more seats. And I'm sitting way back down here in the back in the poor folks section. And bless your heart in the name of everybody that you can name. If that old gal didn't come and sit by me. <coughs> Hallelujah. And I was thinking about sleeping. <laughs> I'm telling you, she sat down. And she said, <laughs> and, you know, took up about two seat space. And I'm trying to sit there. And she said, I thought I was going to miss this plane. And she said, I called the airport. And asked them if they could hold it up. She said. And she just a rattling. I hadn't had time to say good morning. And it's about just after daylight. She said, I am going to a ladies convention. And I am speaking to some ladies about something. I forget. Some kind of highly supercharged, outstanding, dynamic, spiritual something. But anyway. And I'm sitting here kind of rolling my eyes around, you know. <clears throat> and she said... I thought I was going to miss this plane this morning. She said, I'm telling you, sir, it took me an hour and a half to get my face made up to go to this convention. Now, I know what you think, and you could say it, but just think it and don't say it. Okay? I looked at that old gal's face that she had spent an hour and a half on. I'm telling you. I'm telling you. I'm serious. I looked at that mug she had. And she had about a $40 hairdo sitting on top of a $10 head. And I looked at that. I'm telling you. I looked at that and I said, my God, I know I got problems. 
But I would hate to know I had a face. I had to spend an hour and a half on every morning before I could get out of the house. Hallelujah. Now, that's the kind of folks I ride by on the airplane. Now, all you other blessed folks, God bless you. <clears throat> but I'm asking you today, is the devil hurling everything he can against you? Is anybody here going through a trial? I'm telling you, sir, and I'm not asking everybody to hang out your dirty linen today. We're not all doing fantastic sometimes. We, we could do a little better. And if we was doing better, we couldn't stand it. I'm telling you, that's not the way it is. Sometimes we're down in the valley. Sometimes we're discouraged. Hallelujah. I've been to meetings and, and they told me if I do this, I'd have revival. And I wouldn't have any revival because I wasn't doing this. And I was doing all that and still wouldn't have any revival. Amen. And I left discouraged and down and defeated. I'm going to tell you, sir, it's not all always sugar and cream and peaches and cream in life and it's not always easy pastor in a church and it's not always revival uh, and it's not always good things and great things uh, the devil can fight you uh, but you hear me friend out of that eater can come meat and out of that strong can come sweetness in your life hallelujah our God is able to turn it around <coughs> glory to God glory to God glory to God Hallelujah, hallelujah. <clears throat> Praise God. Let me tell you something. You ain't going to like me for telling you, but I'm going to tell you anyway. Hallelujah. Amen. You don't learn a thing worth knowing when everything's going good. If everything was good and sweet and pleasant in your life, you wouldn't be coming to church three months from now. I'm telling you the truth. You know where you learn your best lessons? Hardships, troubles, trials. Necessity is the mother of invention. You know, I grew up so poor, we spelled it with three O's. <coughs> we weren't poor, we were poor, okay? There's a difference in that, I think. And, uh, you know, we didn't have anything, and I'm not, I've always felt rich all my life. And uh, come in, find my mother crying. I'd say, Mom, what you crying about? She said, Son, I don't know how I'm going to feed you children. I don't know how we're going to make it. Well, I'd just take off through the house and go ride down to Pine Sapling and didn't worry about it. We had plenty of cornbread and peas, it seemed like, all the time. A few good things like that. But I remember... Ain't no telling how many miles of roads I made under the house. No telling how many RPMs I turned up with little old bottles and blocks of wood. No telling how many miles I run, brother, go there with an old tire just chasing it. Just, just running, sweat just running off of me. And I'll just roll in that tire, roll it up the hill and roll it down the hill. Just having more fun than a barrel of monkeys. You know, the monkey on the bottom said, this ain't no fun, though. <laughs> Hallelujah. Roll a syrup bucket lid all over the country with a little stick. Now, you rich folks don't know nothing about that. Picking cotton and stuff like that. Hallelujah. Now, he knows what I'm talking about. The rest of you may not. Hallelujah. You know, just all of that kind of stuff. Just We just invented something to play with. Invented something to have fun with because we didn't have anything. But we had fun and we had games and we made up stuff and we played Riddle, Riddle Marie. I see something you don't see. Hallelujah. Anybody relate to that? Praise God. You know, out of hardship, out of difficulty, out of pain, out of suffering, you learn patience in hardship. You learn kindness. You learn love. You learn how to bear with people when you suffer yourself. You learn how to care when you get knocked around a little bit. But you just give you plenty of money and everything you want and just pamper to you and you'll become a spoiled brat. You won't have enough sense to pour water out of a boot. But you give me somebody that's been through hell backwards. 
And I'll show you somebody that knows how to pray. Somebody that knows how to touch God. Somebody that can lay hands on the sick and they will recover. Hallelujah. Is anybody listening to this preacher today? I'm preaching to you that God knows how to take the adversities of life and make good things out of them for you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> I'm not bragging. I bought me a new pickup the other day, a new Ford. The reason I bought it, I didn't have to pay anything down, and there wasn't no interest on it. I sound like a teenager. <coughs> but I'd been driving my other old truck for 10 years, a little over. And I decided, you know, I'm too old and whatever to run around in an old truck. I'm going to buy me a new truck. So I went and bought me a new Ford pickup. Every preacher needs a pickup. Well, I thought they did. I don't guess you do. But you need something. You need a tractor or a four-wheeler or something. Probably all of that. <coughs> I bought me a new pickup. There ain't no use in me trying to fool you. You know, the stinking thing was high. It was so high. 30 something thousand dollars. And I got in it. I'm riding around town. Everybody I see says, Brother Coon, I like your new pickup. You know, I'm a, that $30,000 truck, I'm a pretty snazzy old coon. <laughs> riding around town. Hallelujah. I tell everybody at home, I hope I can live to retire. And I'm going to drive around Gina all the time. 25 miles an hour with my left turn signal on all day. I, I just want to torment everybody that's been tormenting me for 27 years. Everybody in Gina gets in my way. And I may get to do that in that new pickup. <clears throat> but whether I do or not, I don't know. But I'm riding around in this truck, Brother Morton, and I'm feeling pretty good about it, except them payments kind of worry me. Riding along, it rides good. It smells so good. I wish I'd smell that way for five years. It'd help on the pavement. But they don't. <laughs> but anyway, I'm riding around in this truck. I'm looking at it. It's got wood grain on the dash. It's a slick thing. It's a Ford 150. You ought to buy you one. And uh, it's got wood grain on the door. Snazzy thing. It's got more gadgets on it. I don't even know how to operate them. My grandkids got in and said, Papa, this is where you load the CDs in. I said, oh, you kids shut up. I'll take care of all that. <laughs> and I got the manual out and read it, and I can't understand the manual. I'm going to have to go get the grandkids and tell them how to get the CDs out there. <laughs> My Lord, they got more junk on that thing. So I'm riding around feeling pretty good about my new truck. And I get to thinking about that recycling program that's going on. And I said, you know, I sure don't have much reason to have too much pride here. I just wonder how many snuff cans is in here. <laughs> and I got to thinking about all the beer cans they melted and, and the old used pampers that's in there. And the Clorox bottles, they made the windshield out of them, the beer bottles and, and all of that. And they slicked it all up and painted it all up and put forward on it in a big sticker price and sold it to me. And I'm supposed to feel proud and haughty and think I'm somebody. Just riding around in a bunch of recycled tin cans and buckets and bed pans and whatever they made that thing out of. I don't know. But I'm telling you, it ain't nothing but a pile of garbage. It's just been fixed up. But, buddy, I'm telling you, it's a nice pile of junk. Are you listening to me? Hallelujah. You know, you may go over and drink out of a cup, 
that was in a McDonald's trash can last week. Now, they don't go around gathering them up out of the trash can. They just took them in the trash can and made you some new ones. Isn't that something? Hallelujah. I eat cereal every morning. I got to thinking one morning, you know, that old box there's probably in the road ditch a few days ago. Picked the thing up and painted it all up and put cereal in it, sold it to me for four or five dollars. Hallelujah. Amen. You sitting there looking at me through them high priced glasses. It's probably a bunch of old Coke bottles or something here a few days ago. And here we are. We think we got something. Amen. On and on and on and on and on and on and on. That story could go. But I want to tell you something, friend. God's got a way. And I'm not preaching about this world's recycling program. I'm preaching about God knows how to recycle things in life. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. He can take what is bad. He can take what is sorry. He can take what is garbage. Hallelujah. And, and, and I just looked at my watch. Time's getting away from us. But I want to tell you, sir, when you read the story of Joseph and you come down to that grand finale, after he's been through it all, he looked at his brothers and said, sirs, you meant it for evil. You had bad intentions in your mind. You thought you was going to destroy me. But the God of heaven, hallelujah, you just don't understand how he knows what to do with evil. Praise God, because God meant it for good. Hallelujah. To preserve a seed and to save a nation. I'm going to tell you the devil don't have a trick that God can't turn around. The devil don't have anything that he can destroy us with if we will believe in the God of heaven. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Oh, God is a big God today. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Why don't you take your burdens to the Lord and leave them there? He knows what to do with them. Hallelujah. You can be seated. You study the saga of Joseph in Egypt covers a period of about 13 years, if I understand right. <clears throat> he went down there when he was 17 years old, and he stood before Pharaoh when he was 30. 13 years being put in a pit, sold in Potiphar's house, lied on, being put in prison, being forgotten. But, sir, I'm telling you, he's going through the recycling program. God's taking every blow against him, and he's turning it around for good. Glory to God. Don't you fall out yet, by the way, sir. Don't you give up in this great fight of faith. Don't you give up on preaching. Don't you give up on fighting the devil. Don't you give up for discouragement and despair today. My God's going to come through for us after a while. Hallelujah. 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 <clears throat> Amen. Amen. Paul wrote that grand letter to the Philippian church. Hallelujah. That place that they'd put him in the jailhouse and they'd beat him with many stripes. He wrote back to them in a few years and he said, I just want to tell you something, fellas. Everything that's happened to me has happened for the furtherance of the gospel. Praise God. Sir, I'm telling you, you just can't stop an apostolic preacher. Every jailhouse, every shipwreck, every beating I've received, it's just propelled the gospel on because God is in the midst of that. Hallelujah. 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 Brother, God knows how to recycle the devil's business and make something good and make something marvelous out of it. Hallelujah. You know, I've thought a lot of times, <clears throat> and I know God's got a plan, but I've thought a lot of times. Now, we think the devil's smart and he is smart, but he ain't too smart. And I can just give you one for instance. If he would have been very smart, he would have left that Jerusalem church alone. And let them just stay right there in Jerusalem and fuss and fight over who was getting the most to eat and who wasn't getting the right amount. And it would have been like the gingham dog and the calico cat. There wouldn't have been nothing but a little hair left after a while. And that church would have imploded. And it would have destroyed itself. But you know what the ignorant devil did? He said, I'm going to destroy that church. I'm going to send Saul of Tarsus down there to put him in jail. I'm going to persecute them. I'm going to scatter them all over the country. I'm going to mess them up so bad they won't have any fellowship and they'll all backslide. But what you don't know, Mr. Devil, is that when you run them all over the world, they're going to go preaching the gospel. And they're going to start a church somewhere else. And the next thing you don't know, sir, there's going to be an apostolic revival around this world. You hear me, friend? God can take the worst of situations. He can take the sorriest mess. He can take the most horrible environment. And he can bring glory and power. Hallelujah. He even saved that old hateful Saul of Tarsus uh, and made an apostle out of him. Glory to God. You hear this preacher today? I've lived to see what God can do in somebody's life. Amen. 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 Hallelujah. Hallelujah. <clears throat> and I'm trying to wind up here. You can sit down a little bit. 
Praise God. I don't know what time this thing's supposed to be over. But you know, I had never preached till I starved to death. And I'm getting a little hungry, so. <laughs> Y'all don't worry, okay? You're on safe ground. Why don't you make up your mind I'm not going to be offended? I'm not going to quit. I'm just going to see what God's going to make out of this. Hallelujah. Boy, it looks like a mess to me, but you wait till God gets through with it. Did you know that everybody in this building, every preacher and every saint, did you know you're going to have a golden opportunity to get better somewhere in life? Are you listening to me? There's not an exception under the sound of my voice. You're going to have a reason to get better. You're going to be justified. You're going to have a case that is so solid, you could take it to the Supreme Court and win it on the first hearing. There ain't no question about it. You've been done wrong. You've been treated bad. You was right. And they was wrong. And so you got the right, you think, to go around. Did you know? I think it was on May the 13th. Just before our second baby was born. No, it wasn't the 13th. It was the 12th. And that's, see, that's been um, 37 years, 3 months, 10 days, and 4 hours ago that happened. And I just ain't got over it yet. I'm going to tell you what. You live in a miserable hell on earth life. When are you going to make up your mind? I'm going to let that mess go. I don't care what you do. I don't care what you say. I'm not going to walk around with a grudge. I'm not going to walk around with meanness. I'm not going to walk around with vengeance. I'm not going to try to settle any scores. I'm just going to turn it over to God. And God's going to take your garbage. And he's going to make you a better man and a better woman. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. There's people in this building today that knows the tragedies and the hurts and the sorrows and the disappointments of life far greater than I've ever known them. And the musicians can come <clears throat> if they would like. I think my daughter might be here tonight. I'm not sure. I have a boy and a girl. I have a boy, 37. We'll be in a few days. I have a girl, 34, going on 35. A little over nine years ago, our daughter was expecting a baby. Turns out to be a little baby girl. And to make the long story short, she was diagnosed with non-Hodgkin's lymphoma cancer. I've been in more cancer centers and spent more nights in hospitals than I like to think about and spent more dollars than you want to know about. And we tried alternative medicine. We tried everything. She had an inoperable tumor in her chest. The doctor said it is impossible to take it out. But if we give you chemotherapy, in all likelihood, you will die on the first treatment. She said, Daddy, I do not want to take chemotherapy. They told us that at MD Anderson Cancer Center in Houston, which was the second opinion. We went to Raleigh, North Carolina went to an alternative medicine clinic. <clears throat> she was literally dying. She was coughing every breath. The tumor was growing just rapidly. She said, what am I going to do, Daddy? The clinic said, it's not working. We can't do anything. I said, I don't know what to do. I was broken. I was weeping. I was hurt. So... On a Sunday night, I was to the end of my road. We went to Brother Huntley's church. Didn't know anybody. After church, he said, Brother Coon, I got a doctor in my church. I didn't know that. He said, you want to talk to him? I said, yeah. He called him in the office and he started talking to me. The doctor did. And I said, listen, would you talk to my girl? He said, yeah. I said, I'll talk to her. So I called my girl in there and make a long story short. He set her down and he said, now, Vonda, he'd never seen her in his life. He said, Vaughn, I want to tell you what you need to do. And he started telling her. He said, you need to go home 
to where your church is at and your family's at and you need to take chemotherapy. He said, it is a horrible medicine. It's a horrible disease you've got. It's incurable. But he said, somehow God can help you. And he, he began to talk to her. I listened. We got up and left. We started driving back to the room that night and Vonda was coughing every breath. And she said, Daddy, I got an answer tonight. I said, an answer to what? She said, I prayed before service and said, God, let somebody tell me what to do. I don't know what to do. And my daddy don't know what to do. Would you let somebody just tell me what to do? And she said, I want to go home and take chemotherapy. I said, all right. I put her and my wife and her husband on a plane the next morning. I got in the car and I drove. I called the doctor at home. He said, I'll meet her at the hospital. We'll start her. Make a long story short. She won't come to the very brink of death. She vomited day and night for 21 days and nights. She has no recollection of any conversation with anybody over about a 30 day span, sick unto death. One day the doctor called and said, I'm sending her home. I was absolutely alarmed. She was skin and bone. She was dying. I called the doctor and I said, sir, I'm not refuting your opinion. Please tell me, why did you send her home? She is dying. He said, brother Coon, I'm telling you, I don't know anything else to do for her. He said, I will agree with you. She is dying. He said, I cannot help her. He said, if you want to bring her back, I'll start all over, but I don't know anything to do. What do you do when it's like that? So I just simply prayed. I said, God, I don't know what to do. And here I am dying on the inside, it seems like myself. And uh, I'm just, again, to make the story short. We got her out of bed the next morning. And she said, now this is the first time she has vomited for 21 days and nights. She says, I believe I could eat one bite of toast. And she started eating. And she started getting better. And she started getting better. And she started getting better. Now, going on 10 years down the road, she's got a beautiful little nine-year-old plus girl that is totally healthy. My daughter has completed her college degree. And listen to this, Mr. Devil. She is a registered nurse on the cancer floor that she almost died in over nine years ago. Hallelujah. You hear me? When God gets through with everything the devil throws at you, he's going to make something good out of it. Praise God. It's not in my time. It's in his time. And I get in a hurry. I get in a rush. I want it today, but sometimes it's a long time in coming but you just wait on the lord he's going to remold it he's going to remake it and he's going to hand it back to you better than what it ever was hallelujah 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 his brother and sister stevens in the building from michigan brother and sister stevens are you here today stand up brother and sister stevens where are they at Way over here. See that gray-headed woman back there and that bald-headed man? That's brother and sister Stevens from Lansing, Michigan. She is the daughter of Hebert Starr. She is the sister of Bill Starr, who is now dead. Her great-uncle and her mother... Brother M.M. M. Hudson and Sister Stephen's mother were brothers and sisters. And if I understand the story right, 
Brother M.M. M. Hudson and her mother grew up as orphans. And they sold papers on the cold streets of Mishawaka, Indiana. And M.M. M. Hudson dressed her mama up in boys' clothes to sell papers so nobody would molest her. This is many, many years ago. Her mama went on and married Hebert Starr. M.M. M. Hudson grew up and received the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Her mother received the Holy Ghost. Her mom and daddy pastored for years in Lansing, Michigan. Her son pastors that church today. Amen. Did you know that out of that little family of an orphan boy and an orphan girl, there's over 100 apostolic preachers that preaches the Jesus name message connected with the Hudson Star family. Praise God. Brother Marty Ballesterio that preached, his family is a part of that. I want to tell you, sir, the devil don't know what he's doing when he fools with us. When God gets through with your problems, when God gets through with all the garbage and the evil of this world, he's got a way to fix it all up just right. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Praise God. Praise God. I've heard Brother Von Morton preach for... Years and years and years. This is not the first meeting he and I have been together in. And I wouldn't embarrass him. I would, And I'm not going to say anything, Brother Morton. I've never heard this man mention his life from the pulpit. And I wouldn't embarrass him, but I'm saying this for his honor and the glory of God. I don't know of anybody I respect any more than Brother Von Morton. But what most of you don't know is... That his wife walked off and left him with two boys many, many, many years ago. He's never remarried. He spent the last 33 plus years in Fresno, California, pastoring the church by himself. And it is a mega Pentecostal church. And the last time we had a conversation, I didn't ask him today, probably more than that. Last time I talked to him, I believe he told me he had 11 churches that had started out of his church. And every one of them is pastored by preachers that he brought into this apostolic movement. <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Brother Morton, you forgive me if I'm embarrassing you. I wouldn't hurt you for a million dollars. I'm just trying to show these people what God can do with a lonely life that God puts its hand on. Are you listening to me today? Hallelujah. Not to make personal references. My grandchildren, my daughter that I just preached about, married a part Chickasaw Indian. His great-great-grandmother was in the trail of tears as a young girl in the administration of Andrew Jackson. Moved his great-great-grandmother from Cherokee, North Carolina to Fort Washington, Oklahoma, where she is buried now. My grandchildren are members of the Chickasaw Nation, believe it or not. Now, to make that story what I want to tell you is that great great grandmother that was brought from Cherokee as a little girl in the trail of tears she grew up she had a girl that girl gave birth to a little boy that little and that girl died when that little boy was born that little boy grew up in adverse conditions and sad circumstances and he met a girl from Gina, Louisiana, by the name of Theda Randall. And this part Chickasaw Indian wound up marrying Theda Randall. Theda Randall knew about the Holy Ghost. She told Steve McClure about the Holy Ghost. Steve McClure got hungry for God. And he received the baptism of the Holy Ghost. And I want to tell you that my son-in-law is Steve McClure's son. Now today, after all of that trail of tears, Steve McClure is in my church, praising God, living for God. He's got three children full of the Holy Ghost. He is the grandfather to my grandchildren on the other side. And my son-in-law is preaching this gospel. 
I want to tell you, sir, the devil just can't destroy this church. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You think your road is rough, and it probably is. You think you're down in the valley? You think the devil has thrown everything at you? Just hold on to God's unchanging hand. Hallelujah. Recycled evil. When God gets through with the devil's trash. I close with this little story. <clears throat> True story. Several years ago, my wife and I went to Nashville, Indiana. I pastored in Columbus, Nashville, 16 miles away. And there's a lot of painters that used to come to Nashville and they'd paint the landscape. It's a home of a lot of artists. Interesting little town, nice little place to visit if you ever want to go somewhere pretty. Brown County, Indiana, Nashville, Indiana is a beautiful place. Been there dozens and dozens and dozens of times. And on this day we went and they would sit outside and paint a lot. So on this day we went to Nashville, quite a few people in town, we parked. We were walking down the sidewalk and we come up on this big crowd of people. They had the sidewalk blocked. And so I didn't know what was going on, but being nosy like I am, I wiggled my way through the crowd and I got up to the front <coughs> and there was a guy sitting beside the sidewalk and had an easel set up and he was painting a beautiful picture of the Brown County Hills. That's a big artist attraction. Had this beautiful big oil on canvas painting. And right after I got there, <clears throat> not that that was any turning point, but he laid his brush down and he turned around to all of us and he said, now folks, I just finished this picture. And he said, uh, I'm going to sell it. And he said, is it anybody here would like to buy this picture? And of course, like myself, everybody was just kind of casual and tourist. And a lot of folks walked off, but there was a lot left. And so I stood there to see anybody bought it and he said now come on folks come on he said I'm gonna sell the picture who wants to buy it nobody said a word a few more folks walked and I couldn't understand it at the moment but he said all right hateful light he said all right he said who's gonna buy it? I didn't paint this to take to the house come on somebody buy it I, I don't want to take it home come on well it, the way he said it was pretty Hateful, so most of the people walked off. And then he got real belligerent and hateful. And he said, all right. He said, anybody going to buy this picture? Nobody said a word. People started filtering off, and I started to walk off. But I just stood there with my arms folded and watched him. The minute he turned around in a fit of anger, and he grabbed up a big wide paintbrush and dipped it in some paint. And he turned around to that painting. And this is what he did with a paint full of brush. He just went. He said, now you see. Big old dark streaks from the top to the bottom. And I whispered to my wife, I said, this guy's an idiot. And that's the way I felt about him. And so I told her, I said, he's just ruined that nice painting. She said, that's, that's stupid. But for some reason, I stood there and watched to see what somebody that ridiculous would do. And you know what he did? He reached over in his easel and he picked up some small brushes and where he had made those big brown marks he started painting limbs and leaves and making trees and I stood there and I watched him 
And when he got through, it was far prettier than it was when he ruined it. There's some of you today that thinks the Lord has ruined your life. He could have changed what happened. He could have fixed it. But he didn't. And you don't know what to do. Let me tell you, he makes everything beautiful in his time. He's just not through with your picture yet. He's still working on us. You have been listening to an audio production of the First Pentecostal Church of North Little Rock, Arkansas. To order additional copies of this recording, please call our office at 501-758-3090. May God bless you. One God is a treasure chest. Understand the one God. You open up the treasure chest of other great gifts from this God. In Deuteronomy 6 and 4, Moses told that the daily diet of the Jews would be to hear every morning, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. Thousands, a few thousand of years later, Jesus is asked by some men, would you tell us what is the greatest commandment of all? The first and the greatest. He said, it is. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. There is no disputing the one God doctrine. Throughout the Bible, Thousands of times, over 7,000 times to be exact, the Bible refers to God as being one God, one Lord. Yeah.